gentlemen. It, I am so happy to be able to introduce to you our speaker today, uh, Mr. Carl Wilkins. A little bit about Carl. Um, I don't know if you read about him or not. Uh, as a humanitarian aid worker, Carl Wilkins moved his young family to Rwanda in the spring of 1990. When the genocide was launched in April 1994, Carl refused to leave. He was the only American to remain in the country during the genocide. Venturing out each day into streets crackling with mortars and gunfire, he brought food, water, and medicine to groups of orphans trapped around the city, and his actions saved the lives of hundreds, if not thousands. Um, Carl's actions then and his actions now, they really epitomize global engagement, which is one of our three founding goals for the university and founding goals for global learning. And as you'll agree, I'm sure after we visit with him, um, he holds global perspective deep inside his spirit and he is willing to share it with all of us. So, so <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. This is, this is a pretty cool looking setup here, huh? <laughs> I'm thinking that chair is too comfortable. Um, maybe I will just move this up here. As it says, um, round table discussion. I, I'm really hoping we will have conversation here today. I would love, to, love it to be very much conversationally based. Um, to kind of start our um, start our our conversation, though, um, I often like to to just share a little bit. I'm not going to share the whole clip out of here. Um, a documentary. Well, it's not really. I guess you could call it a documentary, but it's it's um, a, a film. A group of filmmakers, a, a film, a team of filmmakers, went to Rwanda to make a film for the government for their. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once here. Not always that good at that. For their tourism board. And uh, it's got just this beautiful scenery of this little country. I just wanted to give you a little, a little glimpse of this, what they call a land of a thousand hills. And, um, you know, I so often just have to pause because there's so many pictures here. And I look at this little kid who's making a drawing on the side of a car. And I'm reminded of another uh, project, a friend of ours, Teresa and I. This is my wife, Teresa, and, and in the conversation, please feel free if you would like to address a, a question her direction as well. Uh, you won't be disappointed. And um, a friend of ours, though, she's got a passion for dancing. She's like, if there's something in your life you just can't live without and something in your life you want to change, find where those two things intersect and be there. And, and her, she can't live without dancing and she really wants to change genocide. So the way it's worked out for her is um, a dance school in Rwanda. Well, actually, it's an organization that works with street kids in Rwanda. Rwanda's been really active in trying to deal with those children who have no home, no place to, to go. And uh, this organization called Fidesco has been working with kids. So when Rebecca went there, she had her own dance company in Philadelphia and stuff, but she's like, this is not doing what, what I need to do. She partnered with them to strengthen their program. So she's brought not only dance, but technology. Great, great story of a little kid who draws solar systems in the dirt. And so when I see this little one drawing on the side of a car, you know, I think of that little kid drawing solar systems in the dirt and thinking, you know, one day, um, I'm going to be an astronomer who's, and I came past your building out here with a new big telescope up there, Eric was showing me, and I'm thinking, wow, what would that little kid think if he came here and, and put his eye up to the lens of that telescope and began to see, but, but um, there's a um, green, 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 that's definitely what you see if you go to Rwanda. It's uh, about a mile high near the equator, but because it's so high, the temperature is just temperate. You can grow. The growing season just goes all around the year. There are um, dry seasons and, and, of course, rainy seasons. But even on the rainy season, rains for a couple hours, and then in the sun, uh, in the afternoon, it's sunny again. And, and um, I think that's the chauffeur of the team. He became a little bit of a movie star during their production. They went home and they just took a bunch of their favorite clips and pulled them together. Um, I, 
uh, I was just, uh, since we've been here in Florida for about a week, been telling students how you could probably stack four Rwandas on top of each other in Florida. I mean, you know, starting down here in Miami, it just, it's not that big, 100 miles by 100 miles roughly, sugar cane. Uh, tea, coffee are some of the main exports from the country. And um, I often pause, well, yeah, I pause on that picture. That, that looks more like Southern California, huh? Than Rwanda. There is, there's, there's wealth and there's poverty, like anywhere in the world. Um, the, the organization and the structure, if some of you would like to talk about that, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to talk about how, let's just say this was a piece of artwork and somebody came with a knife and just started shredding this canvas into a hundred pieces, how would you begin to put it back together? And that would be kind of a visual for what happened to the society in Rwanda, how the genocide just pitted people against each other. A government you thought you could count on the, no, can't count on the government. They're killing you, your neighbors, your friends. Thought you could count on church? No, churches have failed in this situation. Thought you could count on a neighbor? Some, but not many, most neighbors not. So with this shredded tapestry, so to speak, how are you ever going to rebuild? And um, to me, the two things that uh, have been really essential in the rebuilding of Rwanda has been one, visionary leadership, saying, you know what? Why should our country live off of the tax dollars of other countries? We're smart people. We may not have oil, or we may not have, like next door in the Congo, different minerals and things like that, but we've got people, we've got position. If we could establish security here, we could become the financial technical hub for all of Central Avenue, Africa. So having that vision has been huge of, of we don't always have to be, quote, a developing country. And part of that vision, though, has been definitely the empowerment of women. The deeper you dig into that story, the more astounded you are. I mean, most people just get hit right up front. Um, with the idea, I'll just play a few more little bits of footage here. Um, they get hit right up front with the idea of women in parliament. Um, Rwanda's, there's that coffee. Uh, there's a great picture coming up here I want to pause on um, as you just look at these hills here. Well, I'm going to actually be impatient and zoom on forward to it a little bit. Uh, Green, 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 green hills. But uh, Rwanda known for its guerrillas before genocide. Tragically today, you know, and, and Rwanda is almost like synonymous with, with genocide. But um, the guerrillas were part of the story, of course, long before Diane Fossey brought Rwanda onto the international map in many ways. Um, but uh, Rwanda itself is, is redefining itself as you're seeing the the development, um, here we go, the, the city redefining itself so that I think the day will come when people will equate Rwanda with courage. They'll equate, they'll equate Rwanda with resilience. Um, and of course, the role of women in the whole building. It's not just that uh, parliament is now over 60% women. The law in Rwanda, in the constitution, it's written right in. Imagine if we did that only for 10 years in America. That's all I'm asking for. You know, 10 years can go pretty quick. That we would say a minimum of 30% of our senators, our, our representatives, all of our legislators, all of our decision makers, all of our governors, all of our mayors, and keep going, a minimum of 30% would be women. What a change I think we would see in our country. Rwanda, that's been key to it. And as I've shared in the classes earlier today, it's sometimes just as basic as, as a mom's first concern being for, not that all women are mom, I don't want to jump to that conclusion, but a huge segment there. Uh, first concern is for the children. And you know, you might not want to live next door to somebody who was killing. Who would? Who would want to live next door to somebody who betrayed their neighbor and, and, and killed, killed children? Who would want to be anywhere near there? But, but you'll hear it again and again in Rwanda. For the sake of our children, we must, we must forgive. And, and forgiveness being just not this big complicated thing and we put a whole bunch of baggage on top of forgiveness, um, but just simply, I'm not going to be angry or resentful at somebody for a fault, mistake, or offense, the biggest one, the offense. And how am I not going to be angry in Rwanda or resentful? Often it's just, we have to live together. I don't have the luxury of moving out of this house, moving to a different neighborhood, picking another job. I, I, 
for my children's sake, because I want their future, I have to work in this rice cooperative alongside somebody else they, that, that has not, that I might not want to work alongside. Rwanda is also fun focused hugely on um, restorative justice. Yeah, there's been the punitive, absolutely punitive part of justice there too, but restorative justice. Quick little example, your prisons are way overcrowded. Um, in fact, let's come to uh, another picture coming up here a little farther down the road. Um, when you look at the, there, we just went past. <laughs> so it's just hard to believe the, the beauty. This is tea. But of course, in other parts of the country, they're doing terracing for gardening. Look at, look at the slope coming here to the left. That's like, a, I mean, an incredibly steep slope there where the tea is planted. And when, it's, when, when people are just doing their gardens on a steep slope like that, sometimes women will literally tie, drive a stake in the ground and tie a rope around their waist and the stake. So while they're working their garden plot, you know, they, they don't go tumbling down the hill. But what's your hope of putting manure on, on a sloping hill like that from your goats or from your cows or something? So those who are in prison who are willing to confess, a lot of questions here, so please ask them if you, a lot, a lot of questions come to mind, but willing to confess, you don't have to be in prison, you can be in a work camp, and a work camp that is doing literacy training, and at the same time, doing radical terracing, moving that topsoil off, pulling it out till it's sloping back into the hillside, putting that topsoil back on, and, and then when you put your manure on, it's going to stay there. So see this, see this mom in her bare feet with her hoe mm -hmm. working the soil on now a level piece of garden plot that's going to produce three times what the old sloping one did. See her children in that spot. See her grandchildren in that spot. And who built that? It's not like those who, who took lives and killed have in any way erased the horror that they've done or somehow made the, the balance of the scales. No, it's not about scale balancing. It's about rehumanizing and restoring. And, and, and does that make sense to you? The people who were killing were part of the rebuilding process, not just radical terracing, but perhaps building a school, building a bridge. Um, how are we going to be reintegrated? When I visited the prisons in Rwanda, how are we going to be reintegrated back into the community? And is it possible to restore not only the perpetrator, but what about the victims? And, and so this whole, these are powerful conversations to be had about the stories that are coming out of Rwanda's um, recovery. So as we come into conversation here, and I'm looking my clock says 1247, all right, till 1.30. Um, let me just give you a little bit of family background. I noticed a couple of you are in some of the classes, so pardon me for the repeat here. But I'm just going to play about three minutes. Teresa and I travel full-time. We have an organization called World Outside My Shoes. Um, more than the, more than the, um, sorry, the website would probably be the stuff on Facebook page. Sorry, come up here. The problem with this one. There we go. Um, would be our Facebook page, World Outside My Shoes, where you can find. Uh, I didn't think it would be worth it, so hang on. I hope it will be. My uh, screen, for some reason, got super small this morning. somebody else's world outside of my shoes. Did you see that look? <laughs> uh, all that energy. My <laughs> shoes for <laughs> You see, okay, we picked a name and we thought this name is really cool, but nobody can remember. World outside my shoes. There we go. Retrieving suggestion. Thank you. Um, and as you come down, you'll find links. This is actually some students here in Florida who did that painting. Um, but you'll find different links that um, I hope you'll find useful. 
as um, as you explore not only Rwanda and its and its return, but uh, one of my favorite stories is right here. This kid Jordan, and I'm not going to tell the time to tell, take the time to tell his story, but um, I hope that uh, we can interact here as well as as um, later on Facebook and stuff. So the story that I want to um, share with you about our family, I think that's where I last was here. Okay, yeah, we travel around. Yeah, yeah, there we go. We're all about some issues. So Teresa and I travel full time for about six years we've been doing it. We asked a young filmmaker to help us tell the story on film so we could send the film ahead. It's almost finished. Then by the time we get there, we can have deeper conversations about people involved in the story, the relationships that we were build, relationships hoping to save the lives of some people in our home, relationships hopefully to save the lives of some orphans trapped around the city during the genocide, just all kinds of relationships. So I'm gonna just play um, the, the most recent uh, clip of this documentary. It'll give you, it's really quick, and there's always risk when you try to do um, the history in a, uh, a quick fashion um, like this, uh, but uh, it'll at least give us a starting point as we, as we talk. Often I interrupt it to expand on it, but I'm going to control myself and not interrupt it. I'm just going to let it play through here for about the next three minutes. Tutsi people receive preferential treatment, always there's only just so much preference to go around, which means the vast majority of the Tutsi people did not receive preferential treatment, but a certain, a select few did. And the reason I make that a point is it's so easy to try to just make labels and try to figure out, okay, who's here, who's Sunni, Shiite, who's, you know, Bosnian, Serb, what exactly? And, and really it's so much more complex than that. And just because you have this label doesn't mean that was the way it was for everybody. But, but at the time of the Belgians, definitely you had a better chance at education and jobs and stuff if you had a Tutsi ID card. And um, later when independence comes, you had a better chance at jobs and everything else if you had a Hutu ID card. Fortunately, today in Rwanda, the ethnicity is no longer in the ID card. So as, as the Belgian time came to an end, and now we're coming up into the early 60s, uh, independence is coming. But all along, people had lived to a large degree. people were ordered to leave, uh, for some people, the idea of staying didn't even occur to them. And of course, the killing going on around here, the smart thing to do is get out of here. Get those who you love and safely get them out of there. The senior rebel official said the government forces and militia were responsible for the genocide of between half a million and a million people. But in every situation we have a choice. 
I mean, the choices might be greatly restricted. There's people who'd like to take that choice away, and sometimes we'd like to give that choice to other people. But, but it boils down to, uh, really, we do, we do have a choice. And, and lucky is the person like me who had somebody like Teresa standing next to me um, making that choice together. Went to Africa the first time as a college kid. I came back to the States and uh, fell in love. So as soon as I got married with this beautiful girl, six weeks later we moved to Zimbabwe. Our daughters were born there, so Africa just kind of got in our blood. You know, I didn't give a whole lot of thought to what was ahead of <laughs> after I say I do. I knew he was an adventurous person, and I was excited about living overseas. When we moved to Rwanda, our first projects were to build schools, working with ADRA, Adventist Development Relief Agency. Yeah, I met uh, car workers in 1990. Time came to be director for ADRA. Someone was surprised how American young had three kids. <laughs> we were excited to be able to raise our, our kids in Africa. And Rwanda, like other countries we had been in, was very welcoming. The neighborhood kind of took our kids in as neighborhood kids. The kids would go to school, Carl would do his work. I'd take the kids swimming and on birthdays. We go camping, so it was very normal for us. We were pretty much untouched by the the complex that were simmering underneath. And we had two Rwandans working in our home, Jandir the night watchman, and Anita, who not only worked in our home, but she lived with us. And so Anita just proved to be a really kind, thoughtful, she was great with the kids. She would stay with us through the week. We had a room um, in our house with a separate entrance, and we grew to love her very much, like part of our family. Part of the hate radio, before the genocide, another radio station came into play alongside the government radio station, piggybacked on the credibility of the government radio station, and started broadcasting their own messages of division, of hatred, uh, basically this process of constructing an enemy. And, and we could talk more about the construction of enemy if we like, but um, in a nutshell, just to kind of fast forward a bit, the young lady and young man who you met, the plane was shot down at night. He was at our house doing watchman duty. And so he was trapped at our home. They both had Tootsie ID cards. She lived at our home. And the embassy, for understandable reasons, said, you know, Rwandans can't get in the vehicle. I sort of say understandable reasons, but, but we have to talk here too. I mean, okay, their responsibility is to get their citizens out. And they felt if they put the Rwandans in some of those vehicles at roadblocks, there would, there would probably be bloodshed. Um, and, and their best chance of safely getting people out would be to just not have Rwandans. But at the same time, it's not just have or not. What's our alternative? And, and if any of you have seen or read the book, The Rape of Nanking, you've seen some of the different films, John, John Rabe, R-A-B-E, that's on Netflix. Powerful film, film World, World War II. The Japanese soldiers are under the orders to massacre everybody, make an example out of Nanking, bring China to its knees, and about 18 foreigners say, no, we're not leaving. And they stay there and they set up safe havens, which are called not so safe safe havens because of the number of people who still died. But, but still, nearly 200,000 people were not killed in those safe havens. 300,000 were, and I, I hate to just say a number like 200,000 or 300,000, but, but I think so many times people don't know there's another choice, there's an option here. And those 18, the guy in charge, John Rabe, a German, a member of the Nazi party, and yet here he is leading the, uh, the, the safety commission to try to protect people in Nanking. Afterwards, appealing to Hitler himself, trying to get changes. Do you know what's happening over here? And of course Hitler knew, but, and this man almost died in poverty. He had to go through denazification programs, this man who had saved so many lives in China, you know, after the war, and, and, and the people in Nanking found out how, well, Nanjing today, but then found out where he was in his situation, collected money, and a guy got on a plane and flew to Germany, stopped at the grocery store before knocking on his door, and came with a bag of groceries and then more help for his family. And he just realized that, you know, we can't, there's, not, there's always an option, but some options obviously have 
serious risk connected with them. Those folks who stayed in that camp or, or this option of staying in Rwanda during this time. So I could tell you a whole lot more, but I want to want to hopefully field and let's have some conversation. And I don't like to say question and answer because some of these questions aren't going to have answers. And I'm definitely not the answer guy. But uh, if you do have some questions, I'll, somebody help us here switch this to more of a conversational mood and we'll get into more stories i'm sure in the conversation please yeah, i'm more interested in universals i spent most of my time in west africa mm -hmm. in southern africa and as you know the belgians the british the french the germans all did this divide and conquer thing of selecting certain ethnic groups or tribes to be the, the, the premier groups and others below them. And even in, in the era of independence, you still find those categories. What was of, modeled before. Exactly. And it brings me right back to the US, where under Federal Directive 15, our own government still to this day classifies Americans based on whether they're white, black, Asian, Native American. And and whites are those from Western, Northern, Western, Eastern Europe. Africans are, our blacks are classified as people from North Africa. Now even, sub, uh, well, from Southern Africa, I'm sorry. Europeans are included amongst the Northern Africans. So the Egyptians, the Tunisians, the Algerians, even though they're on the African continent, they are considered white in this country. So my question, uh, my, my, I guess my question is why this tendency of people uh, to classify and, and, and favor groups, one group over the other. This seems to be a universal process. I've lived all over the world and I see the, the, these gradations uh, in India. The lighter you are, the better you are. The darker you are, you're at the bottom of the caste system. So from your experience, you know, what do you think it, it drives human beings? to do this kind of, 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 of categorizations, um, not for any good reason, but for nefarious reasons, I think. Really sorry to hear about it here in America. Huh? There's a lot of things we don't know that are there working behind the scenes. And, uh, and you know, I thought it was just maybe on university applications. No. Federal Directive 15 is um, if you apply for any job in this country, that that category is used. So in the spirit of round table, before I give my thoughts, what do you think? Why do we do that? What's the drive? What's the is there a need that's being filled? What 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 promotes it? Not that you have an answer. Have you experienced it? Has it bothered you? Yeah? Do you think that we're somehow soft-wired, if not hard-wired, to classify for the purpose of dominating? Is there, is there another force stronger than domination that you think would drive classification like that? Power dominating, hard to kind of separate the two there. Power, control. Give me some more words, Privilege. some more vocabulary. Privilege, if there's a finite amount of resources to help the largest part for themselves. Okay, so privilege, benefit. We're going to benefit from this. It sounds so far pretty ugly, We're pretty nice. selfish. Huh? We're not a nice species, homo sapiens. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of arguments could be made for that. A lot of arguments could be made for it. Um, what about a sense of belonging? 
is that not right kind of down in there in the depths of who we are a sense of a need to belong so as you think about this need to belong and coming more specifically to your question and and our experiences in rwanda um i i i think that there's um sorry i'm using this for internet i don't know how to turn that sound every once in a while off so please ignore it and i'll do my best to ignore it um this need to belong, this sense of us and them, this idea of in and out. There, there are, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a good percentage of you here are really, really bothered by when you hear, what's your name? Fiorella here to talk about her parents being disrespected and how it feels for her on that. And there's this sense of injustice that comes up inside of us as we hear that. And, and we're like, I don't want, I, I want to change that. So we've, we've got this going on here. On the one hand, huh, privilege felt kind of good, you know? And yet on the other hand, boy, that first class seat was pretty nice. And then yet on the other hand, well, wait a minute, why? So this struggle that's going back and forth, and, and for me, in Rwanda, um, I guess I'm drawn to the people who are those class breakers? I don't, I don't have an answer as to why the need. I mean, privilege is huge driving force. Greed, sometimes there's nothing. Fear and greed, I would say, were two of the largest driving factors in Rwanda in the genocide. Um, and fear and greed obviously feed off of differences, superiority, inferiority, and those types of things. And so. Why do, you, why do you ask your question? Well, as I say, I, I see this, as you were talking about Rwanda, I haven't visited Rwanda, but I've been to memories, and it just brings back a whole flood of memories. In, in Ghana, West Africa, for example, the British, the French, divided tribes mm -hmm. into separate mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. So you have a same tribal group in, in Togo, which is right next to Ghana. Togo was by the French, and the Ghana was, was and the border, and you have the Eve speaking French and the Eve speaking English, but and growing up in different social environments, European social environments, and yet those were used to create conflict and hostilities, artificial, um, but also to play on historic conflicts between <coughs> tribal groups before the Europeans got there. So I, I'm just wondering. What drives that kind of behavior? And as I say, in this country, we have these categories to separate people, and we know the history of right. how mm -hmm. that came about and why it exists today. It's a human, it's a human issue, and I, I guess I'm looking for maybe an explanation from Rwanda, Burundi, <laughs> that could help provide explanations for why we are basically the way we are. And I'm afraid it just keeps, you know, I think of the border between Rwanda and DRC and the tribes that that border separated. And so I'm just thinking, boy, there's more fuel for the fire in Rwanda and Burundi. Um, and and as, as far as an explanation, what comes to my mind, and um, I'm not going to pose like I've read this book. It's a fat book, and there's a long reading list that we all have, I'm sure. But um, Jeremy Rifkin has written a book called Empathic Civilization. And in Jeremy Rifkin's I've, I have, uh, I can say, let's say I've cheated. I've done the short YouTube, YouTube version. And um, I'm not going to play the whole thing for you here uh, right now. But um, I am going to just zoom right in for a second of this. It's called Empathic, Empathic, whoops, pause this here. Empathic Civilization. It's only about nine, um, nine minutes long. But uh, there's one part that I'm going to come to right here. He talks about back here and identity, and I think this is probably what's key to um, what's key to part of understanding your question is this sense of identity. Where do we get our identity? When we want to conquer or dominate, what do we do to other people's identity in order to conquer and to dominate? And uh, let's see if I'm about at the right place. Their brain wouldn't be the same as the wiring of a forager hunter 30,000 years ago. So the question I asked at the beginning of this, so the question I asked at the beginning of this study six years ago, is how does consciousness change in history? Because I wanted to imagine the following proposition: Is it possible that 
we human beings who are soft-wired from empathic distress, this is, is it possible theory. we could actually extend our empathy to the entire human race as an extended family and to our fellow creatures as part of our evolutionary family and to the biosphere as our common community? If it's possible to imagine that, then we may be able to save our species and save our planet. Okay, so I won't play the whole thing, but his whole idea is breaking down these barriers and his empathy, the hand, that's going to do it. And I just want to do this one little part here, a little bit farther down the line. Um, when he talks about in history, um, we, we originally were uh, different tribes. And yeah, right here would be good. Just to extend the central nervous system and to annihilate more time and space and bring more people together. And the differentiation of skills and the increasing selfhood not only led to theological consciousness, but empathy now extended to a new fiction. And that is, instead of just associating with one's blood ties... That was the first one that I just went too fast over, was blood ties. And I like his use of the word fiction, because this is what it really is. We're, con we're fabricating artificial uh, divisions. We detribalized and began association based on religious ties. So in new fiction, Jews start to see all other Jews as extended family and empathize with Jews. Christians start to see all other Christians as extended family and empathize with Christians. Muslims, the same. <laughs> and so a little sense of humor there. Um, but, uh, and, then, and then you move on to political and, and fiction, state fictions, and those are the borders that you're talking about. So I think definitely a part, and we'll move on forward with our conversation, but in the rebuilding of Rwanda, I would say the sense of empathy. Um, I can introduce you to several of my friends who are actually going back and, and moving back home to where their home was destroyed, where family members were killed, and, um, and, and trying again to build relationships, quote, with the enemy, with the Hutus. And so what, what role would empathy have if we, we can't just accept, okay, this has happened again and again in so many different countries. Historically, we've seen it again and again. It's always going to be that way. No. If you believe that, then yes. <laughs> but if you don't believe that, and, and I would go down that, that, that uh, avenue or arm of empathy. And what does it take to develop empathy? And, and besides his arguments about being softwired for empathy, what can we do in our life to become more empathetic people? And, and so, thanks for bringing that into the conversation. Another question or comment that you'd like to explore? Please, and then I'll come. I have a, a question coming from the, in, the individualistic point of view rather than the collective, but the sure. individual. So I'm in the international development field, and um, a lot of cynicists in that field say that um, individuals go to developing countries because they're quote unquote danger rangers. Um, they like the danger. Thrill, yeah, adrenaline. They get off on the danger, they have thrill with the danger, and if one is so empathetic, why not stay in one's own backyard and express that empathy in one's own backyard? But there's something not hardwired in the danger ranger that provokes that person to go into zones of danger. How would you respond to that? I'm sure there's, there's, that's got to be an element of truth to that. Um, I, I would say for myself, um, in college, I had an opportunity to travel. And I think um, exploring is gonna be all different kinds of people who are gonna explore, but I had a service learning program at my college that let me go for a year to South Africa back in 1978. And as I went there, um, it, it was exciting to be in a new country, new culture, new things to learn and sights to see and everything. But, but then as you spend more time, not just a two-week visit, but and in that case, even it was just a year, but that was a significant chunk of time, a year there, you started saying, wait a minute, I really like this, the way that these people take time for one another. You know, back at home, we're in such a hurry, and nobody's taking time for anybody else, and often is the case and stuff. And I like, oh, you mean really the, the, the actual building of the school isn't the most important thing or the process is also so you start to learn from these cultures and i think you begin to appreciate so it's always going to be an interesting mixture of and and for some people they will and they'll just be three months in this zone and three months in that zone what i found during the genocide was that um this isn't like other situations 
of uh, excitement or adrenaline junkie type of situations because um, in many situations you're challenged, you're pitted against the elements and stuff. This was just so overwhelming. There was no challenge here. It was just, it was seemed impossible on so many levels. And, and when something seems so impossible and overwhelming and in, by some people's standards suicidal, well then um, that sense of empathy and, and I'm happy you've asked the question because we've discussed in making this film parts to include and not. And there is a section of conversation about are you just looking for a thrill? Or, or is there really something deeper here? And I think what we've tried to build and, and communicate in the story here is by living, by our children being born there, by spending time connecting of hearts to hearts together. It goes much beyond just simply another adventure and of course something like the genocide is is so extreme that it's it's more of a breaker than a enticer into something else it was it was the breaking of people many of the u.n soldiers came out of this thing uh, severely severely damaged and uh, psychologically one of the canadians well i won't go into more but it was it was um it was soul destroying on many levels, uh, things that you thought you could count on, you could not count on. And, and so I think it's really good to have your eyes open and aware um, that people do come at these things for many, many different reasons. But that also, we have to be careful as we discover these, quote, categories, that we don't quickly whoo, shove this one into that category or this one into that category. But to take time for people to be able to describe and find their own way the pastor who was with me during the genocide, a Rwandan man who is, I have an incredible amount of respect for Pastor Soraya, his wisdom and stuff. As I go back and I ask him, just in October I was in Rwanda, and I was asking him more questions about the government and the dynamics as this is changing, but now 63% of the parliament are women. I mean, when are they gonna stop here in Rwanda? You know, we've gone on and it's not, is, it, is uh, men will soon be a tiny minority in the parliament, you know? Um, and, and he, he said to me, you know, never forget, we're learning. This country is young and it's learning. And if you, if you remember that, that, you know, the person you see right now, you're like, oh, wait a minute, you know, well, that looks pretty good, but ah, that, that is not, they're learning. And if we'll keep that teachable spirit and, 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 and a gracious spirit to not only, I'm still learning, and, and I need to learn, but you're learning, and we need the grace and the humility to be able to recognize, hey, okay, no ideas are new. They've all been around before, but as we're applying them in this situation, we're learning, and you know, that's a good idea. I think my idea wasn't near as good as that. I wanna run with you on that idea. And that kind of spirit, I think, is uh, um, something that excites me. You had a question. I had a question based on what you were talking about, the divisions, how they put different tribes together to create the tensions. Mm -hmm. um, or actually separated them. Or separated them to create them. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing that for control, to control. So how can we change that if you are not the people in charge? You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. how you're saying you see it even now in how how of the groups. Mm -hmm. So I know we're saying that it's for selfish reasons, but how does that change? How do you see it? Somebody like to I'd just like to add on to that. I was also wondering, I haven't followed the genocide since uh, a couple of years ago. I, my focus was a lot of things going on. I know really. Um, in South Africa, you said you were in South Africa, they had a after apartheid, they had a truth and list reconciliation, reconciliation commission. Yeah. In this country, after slavery, we never really did have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering in 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 uh, in Rwanda, have they had truth and reconciliation commissions? And that's kind of getting, I think, maybe at your question as to what can we do next to get beyond what Absolutely. we've experienced. I mean, we have to come out and confess and admit our wrongdoings and to those who we did them to and to ask for and receive forgiveness um, and we really didn't do that in this country after slavery south africa is a good model 
and I'm wondering if it happened in Rwanda. And I think it's a good model, and perhaps that could, if we had that in this country, still not too late. Um, maybe we can get beyond some of the conflicts we see between groups here and, and elsewhere. But in Rwanda, have they had that process? Rwanda had its own version. They called it the Chacha, G-A-C-A-C-A. The Chacha, it sounds like the Kaka, the Chacha. And um, basically it involved confession. It also involved forgiveness. Say Thursday afternoon would be when schools and businesses are all struck down and everybody, everybody comes to the local soccer field in the neighborhood. Those were often the easiest places to gather people together. And those who were willing to confess from prison would come out. A group of people were chosen from the community, usually about seven people, given some basic training as judges, facilitators, moderators, because the people coming from prison, it's not, this is not a typical court situation. They're not having a defense attorney. And I mean, lawyers pretty much, I'm, I'm told, didn't like a chacha because it, it went against a lot of the typical legal proceedings. But Rwanda's like, we have so many. How are we ever going to bring any kind of um, moving forward and healing and anything from this? So, you know, for many people, gachacha wasn't just hearing a person say that what they did was wrong. That's important. That's huge just hearing that by itself. But it was also finding out where your aunt was buried, where your grandma was buried. Mm -hmm. and, and it gave people permission to talk about this. Why are you talking about the genocide now? I know, that's the past. And why shouldn't the past be in the past? And you know, are you, whose side are you on anyway? And they could be very charged conversations. But Gachacha, after a session on the soccer field, Thursday afternoon, in the evening, you're heading to the local bar with a friend and you're still talking about what was there. It kind of gave permission to talk about it. And, and, and to begin to unpack these different feelings. And so not a perfect system by any means, but definitely a system that has a lot of lessons to learn and, and that brought many different benefits. I've just touched on a couple of them. I mean, it was a very dynamic situation too because it was up to the community. And sometimes there were few survivors, sometimes there were hardly any survivors. So who's gonna contradict the testimony of this guy who's coming up here? And he's gonna have his time in prison cut in half for coming and confessing. So, uh, wait a minute, is that real confession or not? Is he just wanting to get out of prison early? So there's a lot of uh, complexities in, involved here. But um, Rwanda was finding its way through this in the best way they could because it was very different from South Africa's situation to the extent that the killing happened in Rwanda and the freshness, and we're talking about just you know all within these three months, and it had its own unique set of circumstances. But um, I think overall, and it's about June, not last year, but June 2012, that they finally wrapped up 18 years after the genocide, their last Gachacha um, trials. Now, it's not like they're done by any means, still facilitating, providing an environment where you can talk about these things safely and, and, and um, where stories of forgiveness are still, opportunities, I should say, for forgiveness are still presented to people there. But, uh, I, I spent time in an office last January with um, a lady working in Rwanda's prison system. She's a survivor of the genocide herself. And um, I'd love to get her story in a book. She lost her dad when she started working in the, in the genocide. When she started working in the prison system, they thought she's just here to get revenge on all of us. And, and the levels of trust that she showed to the prisoners to the point now that many of the young men who've been released come back to her to help write a resume for a job application counseling. This lady has worked into, and she's an incredible example. She came to America of, of restore to justice, came to America. She toured some American prisons and she's like, wow, you have everything in these prisons in America except humanity. And she saw a, a, a history, a museum of prisons. Oh, the apparatus you used to have in your prisons and the things you did. So these conversations are so valuable to have with the people of Rwanda who not only are, are potentially victims themselves, but most of them are saying, no, 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 I'm no longer defined as a victim. That's not how I move forward. That was, I was a victim, but I'm not now still a victim. And that whole sense of mentality is, is huge in this moving forward uh, of that. But, but Gachacha is well worth looking into. Um, there's a film about the genocide, Hollywood productions, you know, they're all pluses and minuses, but it's called um, Sometimes in April. And at the very end of this film, sometimes in April, circulated by HBO, 
uh, at the end of it is a lady. It's just a short scene of Gachacha, but it gives you a little bit of introduction. I should have some better resources for you with Gachacha. I don't. A couple of films, though, that I think are really important in the reconciliation process. Wounded Healers. Wounded Healers is one of them. Another one is called As We Forgive. Um, and so some really valuable resources in trying to get the stories out of this reconciliation. First priority, huh? Your family. Um, and you know, it's just a good time. Just, just took a picture. I'm glad we always forget to take pictures. But uh, when you when you stop and you think about this whole decision that we made, there's we met in high school. You know, she's a junior and I'm a senior, and and uh, in high school. And um, right after graduating from college, we got married. And then a week after getting. I mean, after week after graduating, we get married. Six weeks later, we moved to Zimbabwe. She's 22, I'm 23. We're just kids, huh? Gone to Africa. And and I, when you think about protecting, um, her part was much harder. You know, they always focus on me the way you stayed. But you imagine. This love that lets go. This love that's willing to. Because I wasn't arguing with her about this decision. I'm so glad I wasn't in her place. <laughs> and I'm so glad we had kids. Because she would have wanted to stay. And I wouldn't have wanted her there. She was at double risk being a woman as well. And, and so, so, how do you do that? How do you protect your family? How do you make the choices that are so important? together somehow, you do this, you talk together, you, 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 you see the different options, she brings different options to the table, I bring different options to the table, um, you don't know what's always ahead, fortunately, I don't know if we would have made the decision that I would stay if we would have known how many people were going to be killed, if the embassy would have let us bring Rwandans in the vehicle, we probably would have put those two people in a vehicle and I wouldn't have stayed. Probably. That's my best guess. I wouldn't have stayed because your family is such a high priority. Um, myself, that idea of protecting myself, I'm going to go back to with the family and myself. Relationships. And a couple of the classes, and I haven't mentioned it in this time, but, but um, our neighbors stood in front of our gate the first night of the genocide and they said no to the guys with machetes and clubs. You can't go in that house. Basically, their kids play with our kids. So we had neighbors standing in front of our gate advocating for, arguing for us. I think relationships are our best, best bet at protection. We're Christians. We believe in a connection with our Creator and our Maker. Yet after the genocide, I'm not one that's going to say, well, God protected me. I think personally, more often than not, God works through people. And so the relationships that we form, the relationships we form in the Middle East, the relationships we form here in Miami, the relationships we form affect the way we think which affects the way we feel and affects the way we act. So if we see people as, quote, the enemy, or as we see people as potential allies, I think that speaks volumes to security, you know? And, and I think as we're, um, I don't know how it went with um, Hillary Clinton as our Secretary of Foreign Affairs. You know, what did she bring as a woman to that office? And if anybody written books and examined when she was in the Middle East, how was she any different than all of the male counterparts before her? You know, how, how does Condoleezza Rice, what did she bring up? How does Samantha Powers as our ambassador to the UN, what is it there that is, and, and some we would say don't bring much difference. They're bringing the political. Others, there's something that they are bringing in that. I don't know. Thanks for asking that. Please. Um, I really want to ask, because uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to experience something like what you experienced. What is what you think the most important thing that you brought of it that you could give to us to like, uh, um, remember? I think uh, one of the most important things uh, is 
is listening to the people around you. Now, on one hand, everybody around me is saying leave. And, and so you're like, oh, really? You leave? On the other hand, I'm referring more to the local people, the people of Rwanda, the people of Iraq, the people of Afghanistan. How much do we know? I mean, you know, I read Kite Runner, and that was my first real introduction into life there in the Middle East. With, with, who's the Taliban anyway? I hear on the news and everything else. And you know, and after, um, what was it, a thousand sun, sunrise, sunset? What? A thousand sunsets. Sunsets, the second book after yeah. Kite Runner, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and then eat three cups of tea, you know, different, different books that have been around and stuff like that, but that introduce us into the homes of the people and the cultures of the people. I know Three Cups of Tea went through its different challenges, but, but boy, I love the idea um, that he communicated there about connecting with the people where you are. And in connecting with those people, you know, we come in and like, ah, oh, man, you need this, you need that, you need the other thing. Oh, I've seen that before. Well, that happened in this country. We need to do it there. Just shut up and listen. I think that's one of the most important things. Shut up and listen. I think the other thing would be, um, what I see in Rwanda, and we can wrap up with this note, what I see in Rwanda is um, this focusing on what we still have. You're never going to forget what you lost. You will not forget your family members. And, and same here in America, you know. But, but we're also not going to be robbed by that. I, the closest comparison I can come up with in America is the tragedy of suicide. And how so many times when we we'll remember somebody who took their life in suicide, Suicide is what dominates the whole thing. It's like suicide has 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 hijacked everything else. Their their generosity, their sportsmanship, their uh, sense of humor, whatever. And in Rwanda, same thing. Genocide could like consume everything. But they've got a project right now in Rwanda that's called the Book of Life, where they're asking people to write letters to those who they lost. They're even taking it in the prison. Dad, I'm a nurse today. Many of the kids from our community have gone on to university. I had the skills then that I have now. Maybe I've saved your life. There's still parts of those letters back to the genocide, but parts are coming for Dad, uh, cell phones, you wouldn't believe what's up. And in this <coughs> writing letters to those who have been in the past, they're somehow unfreezing them from being totally taken over by genocide and controlled by this. Experience. And, they're, and they're, they're able to tap back into who that person is and who we are today. And I think it's been beautiful. Even in prisons, um, um, forgetting her name, Kiki. She, she's gone into prisons, and this young man wrote a letter to the teacher that he was part of the gang that went to his house and, and, and said, you know, I know I can't ask your forgiveness because you're dead, but I was so impressed when we came to your house, you received us with such kindness and graciousness as if you had no idea why we had come there. And you know that teacher knew why they had come there. Please forgive me. Writing these things out in letters have been part of this healing process of confession, another form of truth and reconciliation. But, but this whole idea of and then being able to live and then say, okay, now, you know what? I, I, I'm this student, I don't know where they are now, but I could easily imagine them or others saying, you know what? I'm committing my life now to breaking down these barriers that I fell um, subject to. And, and, and and who would be a stronger voice than that kid in this room today? Saying, you know what? This is the way it was, but it doesn't have to be this way. And so people committing themselves to now doing double and triple duty because of what was there. And you'll find that again and again in Rwanda. This lady says, you know, my husband was a hard worker. I'm working double hard now. We don't have many family members left. But for those we have left, we are cherishing these things. So those are some of the lessons that I think are really valuable as that can come out of Rwanda in this thing. Not being dominated by what we've lost, not always focusing on what was taken from us, but focusing on what remains and what do we do with what remains. And that's, that's huge for me in, uh, in my life. Where's my focus? What I don't have, what's been taken, what I think I should have, or what I do have, and what we can do with. Um, during the genocide, after about the second week, I realized that I might not see, not trying to be dramatic or anything, but I might not see Teresa and the kids again. I might not survive. I started talking on cassette tapes, telling them what was happening. We got to talk every day on the radio. It was great, but there's certain things you couldn't say on the radio. 
At the end of the dance, I'd had eight or nine hours in these tapes. A couple, of, two years ago, I got them out of the shoebox, and I finally, I never thought I'd write a book. But I finally, um, thank you, darling, finally put those. So the stories in here are basically stories I, I recorded the day they happened, or a week after. So even though it's written 17 years later, they have fresh vocabulary, quotations, and stuff from the tapes that I made. So if you'd like to take a copy of this, you're welcome to take a copy, share it with a friend, you're welcome to do that. If you can make a donation, that's cool. It doesn't have to be today. There's a website in the back of the book, a PayPal button. The donations are what help keep moving the books forward. It's a pay it forward system. Don't think if you really want to read the book that, oh, I'll just order it online. And, and later, because we're self-published, so we have to mail it to you if you order it online. Now, we're happy to do that, but if you could take it today and you want to make a donation later, fine. When you graduate from college, I always tell people you can make a larger donation. <laughs> but no, if you'd like to read the stories, you're